Charlemagne the God attempts to roast DEI, but does he even know what it is? Stay tuned right after this. Hey y'all, what's up? This is attorney Chloe Corbett, AKA the Duchess of Justice. I am one half of the Defiant Lawyers, where we provide legal analysis of trending politics, policies, personalities, and pop culture to empower each and every one of you all to defy this unjust legal system and nullify systemic racism. So thank you once again for joining me in this video. If you are a subscriber, and if this is your first time seeing my face or watching our videos, why don't you go ahead and hit the subscribe button? Let's get right into this. So you, look, y'all, y'all know that we have been criticizing The Breakfast Club for the past few videos for giving a platform to Candace Owens, um, to all of these um, conservative white supremacist political uh, candidates that were running for president, and all around giving a platform to uh, idea and thoughts that will not help the black community and may even help to Trump being elected, which we are a no MAGA zone here. And Charlemagne, look, I've, I've watched him for a long time now. I watched The Breakfast Club for years. I have watched his other podcast with comedian Andrew Schultz. I have followed him. And while he's always been problematic, and especially the things that he has said against women, which he has apologized for, I did like that he has been a big proponent of therapy and trying to heal trauma. But as of late, he has gone beyond the pill in given these negative conservative talking points and the latest statement that he made. So he hosted the daily show. He has done that a couple of times in the past. As some of you may know, the daily show has been without a constant host for a while now. It was famously hosted by Jon Stewart for a very long time in which he bought a lot of biting criticism against some of the Republican talking points. He was then followed by Trevor Noah, who was up there for a few years. And since Trevor Noah has left, there's been a variety of people that have hosted that show. So last week, Charlemagne hosted The Daily Show. In his opening statement, I want to go through what he said about DEI. So let's go through it. He said, first, quote, the truth about DEI is that although it's well-intentioned, it's mostly garbage. It's kind of like the Black Little Mermaid. Just because racists hate it doesn't mean it's good. I'm right because every one of you has sat through one of those diversity training sessions and thought this is some BS. So that is in part what he had to say about DEI. Charlamagne, let me give you a history of DEI and why it was necessary and what the intentions of it actually were and what the results were as well. According to a 2022 article from the McKinsey publication, this is what they had to say about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They say diversity, equity, and inclusion are three closely linked values held by many organizations that are working to be supportive of different groups of individuals, including people of different races, ethnicities, religions, abilities, genders, and sexual orientations. They define diversity as someone who is represented in the workforce. It could be gender diversity, age diversity, ethnic diversity, etc. Equity refers to fair treatment for all people so that the norms, practices, and policies in place ensure identity is not predictive of opportunities or workplace values. Equity differs from equality, they say, in a subtle but important way. While equality assumes that all people should be treated the same, equity takes into consideration a person's unique circumstances, adjusting treatment accordingly so that the end result is equal. Inclusion refers to how the workplace experiences the workplace and the degree to which organizations embrace all employees and enable them to make meaningful contributions. Companies that are intent on recruiting a diverse workforce must also strive to develop a sufficiently inclusive culture such that all employees feel their voices will be heard. So that is how a McKinsey publication defines a diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to note one thing about diversity. It's not just racial diversity, according to McKinsey. However, we know that if you look back through the history of affirmative action and the intent behind getting African-Americans on an equal front, 
that is really what DEI was about, to make sure that African Americans have equal opportunity, equal access to opportunities, that we are fairly represented in the workplace, in schools, in higher level education, et cetera. And that was really the intent behind DEI as well. DEI and affirmative action are really closely linked. And we have to go back decades to the mid-1960s where the civil rights movement was in full force, where various leaders like Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, Ralph Abernathy, Malcolm X, and other leaders were really fighting for the equality of African Americans. But the inception of affirmative action goes back to an executive order issued by President John F. Kennedy in 1961. The executive order is 10925, and it required racial fairness in employment funded by the federal government. The order required federally funded employees to, quote, take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed without regard to their race, creed, color, or national origin. Okay, so again, Executive Order 10925 said that employers must take affirmative action to make sure that applicants are employed without regard to their race, their color, etc. Now, we know that President Johnson issued this order because at the time, African Americans were not given racial fairness in employment, both in the private and the public sector. And so when Charlemagne comes on and says that DEI is BS and it does nothing, what he's really doing is he's going back and he's attacking affirmative action. Because all the purpose of all of these initiatives and these concepts are to make sure that African Americans have fair access to the employment and other opportunities as white people in this country. That is the purpose of it all. And so the fact that he's working for the Breakfast Club and is able to work as a radio host and be on YouTube and all of the other things that he's doing, it is because of policies like this, and not just policies, but laws as well. The Civil Rights Act of 1965 and others ensure that we have this access, equal access to it. And the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies that follow are ways to implement what the civil rights laws have stated. And keep in mind, we're going to be doing a video about this. We are civil rights attorney as well. We sue police departments. We sue corporations for racial discrimination uh, against people. But because of the Supreme Court we have today, there is a concerted effort to weaken racial discrimination lawsuits against banks, against other businesses, against your employers, against a store that refuses to serve you. There's a concerted effort to weaken the ability to do that because they've included an intent effort. So you literally have to show that the intent of the person who was discriminated against you um, was racially motivated. And so that was put in place by the Supreme Court on purpose to lessen the ability of us black folks to hold corporations and people accountable when they discriminate against us. So this is all tied together, Charlemagne. He tried to make, a, make it a joke and say, well, all these corporations, they have all of these ads, and he played a few ads from various businesses about their efforts to diversify and be inclusive in their workplace. It's not a laughing matter to me because I know that there are or were countless thousands of black folk who were treated differently simply because of the, the color of their skin. So following President Kennedy executive order, and then subsequently after his unfortunate assassination, President LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, he issued his own executive order, 11246, on September 24, 1965. It established requirements for non-discriminatory practices in hiring and employment on the part of U.S. government contractors. It prohibits federal contractors and federally assisted construction con contractors and subcontractors who do over $10,000 in government business in one year from discriminating in employment decisions on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It also requires con contractors to, quote, take, again, here's these words, affirmative action 
to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, color, religion, sex, or national affirmative or national origin. As we mentioned before, that phrase affirmative action appeared previously in Executive Order 10925 as well. All of these executive orders are coinciding with civil rights and black people fighting for equal pay, equal housing, job security, and all of that. This is all happening in the mid-1960s. So that's where this concept of affirmative action has started. And it coincided with like the, the landmark civil rights legislation that I described before. I think I said it was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 1965. It's really of 1964. Um, but the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a landmark civil rights and labor law that outlaws discrimination, again, on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. It prohibits unequal application of voter registration requirements, racial discrimination in schools and public accommodations, and employment discrimination. And it has been described as, quote, one of the most significant legislative achievements in American history. So why is it that 100 years after slavery was ended, after the Reconstruction period, where it seemed that African Americans would be become an actual part of the American dream, that 100 years later we finally get this landmark civil rights legislation? It's because we didn't have access to it before, right? We had Jim Crow, we had the slave codes, we had all of these legal measures to keep African Americans at the bottom and from participating in this so-called American dream. So if you look back into the history of why the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was needed, affirmative action, and then subsequently these DEI policies to help implement all of these anti-discrimination laws, we have to go all the way back to the 1800s. In 1883, the United States Supreme Court at that point had ruled that Congress did not have the power to prohibit discrimination in the private sector, which thus stripped the Civil Rights Act of 1875 of much of its ability to protect civil rights. Okay, And so in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the legal justification for avoiding the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was to invalidate most of what the federal government was doing to regulate private businesses from not discriminating against African Americans. Okay, It was finally in the 1950s and 60s that the Supreme Court justices began to change their mind and with the help of the March on Washington and again, the executive orders that were issued where we finally got this Civil Rights Act of 1964 after we had the Civil Rights Act of, 18, of 1957. Charlemagne, there's a history behind these policies and why diversity, equity, and inclusion is needed. And the Supreme Court at, at one point was trying to say that private companies could not be regulated by the, the federal government. Thus... African Americans had no protections against a company who didn't want to hire a young black woman just because she's black or a bank not wanting to allow someone to withdraw their own money because they're black or going to a movie theater, like in the case of my family and experiencing racial discrimination and then having the cops called on you. These all stem from the same thing. So why you're making jokes on the daily show and making fun of it and bringing up these ads there, there, there are real consequences of this new MAGA movement to, as they did, get rid of affirmative action. Now they're targeting DEI and putting a target on the back of successful black people by saying, oh, the only reason that you got here is because of DEI, not because of your own merit and not because protections are needed because of the actions that the federal government, state government, and the private sector has done against black people in this country. So this is not just this is not just jokes and games, Charlemagne. This is real life that is having a real effect on real people. So who are these real people? Let's get into it because there was a huge story that just came out a couple weeks ago here in Texas about uh, UT Austin letting go a number of professionals and people who were in this space. 
So for those of you all who don't know, in the state of Texas, on January 1st, there went into effect anti-DEI legislation that was signed by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. It banned diversity, equity, and inclusion offices and initiatives at public universities and colleges. We know it as SB 17. So I want to go into a little bit of, of what Texas is doing in regards to this. So Texas defined diversity, equity, and inclusion office as an office division or other unit of an institution of higher learning established for the purpose of one, influencing hiring or employment practices at the institution with respect to race, sex, color, or, or ethnicity, other than through the use of colorblind and sex-neutral hiring processes in accordance with any applicable state. So again, they're trying to get away from the protections that were put in place at the federal level back in the 1960s with the executive order, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, etc. I mean, this is just so infuriating. This is so upsetting that the protections that so many of our leaders and people in our community that gave their life for just half a century later are literally being torn down. People gave their lives to this cause. Literally gave their lives to this cause. And now you have MAGA and other conservatives coming in with the black conservatives that support them and people like Charlemagne who callously and naively make these jokes about DEI and calling it BS. This is real life affecting real people. For example, at UT Austin, which is one of the largest schools in the nation, it is the biggest school in Texas. I went to UT Austin, but only 4.5% of UT students, and I think there's about 50,000 uh, students at UT, only 4.5%, according to USA Today, of UT students in the fall 2023 semester were black. And black students were not even allowed to attend UT until the 1950s. Quote, most black students, they're one of maybe two, maybe three other people of color in the room. And so that creates this really isolating space for people of color, uh, according to uh, this person. So what has happened? UT has laid off dozens of people, dozens of professors due to SB 17, due to this anti-DEI sentiment. Um, earlier this month in, in April, the University of Texas Austin President Jay Hartzell announced a staff and shakeup as a result of SB 17, according to Fox Austin. And in an email sent to students and staff, he said in part, quote, we are closing the Division of Campus and Community Engagement and redistributing the remaining programs. As part of this reallocation, associate or assistant deans who were formerly focused on DEI will return to their full-time faculty positions. The positions that provided support for those associate and assistant deans and a small number of staff roles across, across campus that were formerly fo focused on DEI will no longer be funded, end quote. So basically those people lost their jobs. Those people who were focused on campus engagement, community engagement, reaching out to black students, minority students, uh, making sure that they have a full experience of higher level education. All of that was cut because of this new law that was passed. People have literally lost their lives and their economic livelihood because of white conservatives like Greg Abbott and other states and those on the federal level who are trying to do this as well. This, this is not a game. It's really, really affecting people. According to one article, the school's chapter of the American Association of University Pro Professors has estimated that 60 people in, in DEI roles at the campus were let go. One group who vigorously opposed this move argued that the cuts violated employees' rights to academic freedom, due process, and freedom of expression. On April 1st, 
I want to read a part of a letter that the executive committee of the UT Austin Advocacy Chapter of the American Association of University Professors with the Texas Legislative Black Caucus wrote to UT Austin President Herzl. They say, in part, as a professional organization dedicated to ensuring academic freedom and freedom of expression, shared governance, and due process, our AAUP chapter has serious and urgent concerns about your action on all three counts that fall within our purview. Academic freedom and freedom of expression. Terminating staff for their previous lawful association with DEI initiatives is discriminatory and infringes on their freedom of expression. These employees all pivoted to nine DEI activities on January 1st at your direction. So the terminations are not based on their job performance or behavior since that date, but rather their involvement in the very DEI activities that were previously hired to lawfully carry out. They criticized this decision on the basis of transparency. In their letter, they say, finally, in the absence of any information from your administration about the number of professional staff and faculty involved, nor how many of them are members of underrepresented minority groups, we have concerns that these terminations would have, will have a disparate impact on certain, po on certain populations possibly in violation of federal law. Lastly, they, they criticize this decision on the basis of due process. They say that faculty and staff at the university expect due process when the administration makes decisions that affect our livelihood and work conditions. Your termination notice completely violates these expectations of due process. Staff who have been, de who have been terminated deserve to be told why they're being terminated and they deserve a grievance process. Again, it's having real impact, and it's having real impact on black students. When I went to UT Austin, I know how it felt. I was a chemical engineering major at the time, one of the toughest majors that you can study, and there were one or two of us in all of my classes. And it was isolating, and I did struggle. And if it were not for some of these programs, especially when I switched universities, it really could have led to a very, very different place for me. And I know that there are other black students who feel the same as well. Well, this is driving black students to go to HBCUs. I was reading one article where HBCU enrollment has skyrocketed. And that's, I think that that is a good thing despite all of the bad that is being done with getting rid of these DEI policies. So back to Charlemagne's comments, it's obvious he doesn't really know what DEI is. He, he tries to roast it, but he really made himself look very intellectually not smart, <laughs> to put it kindly. Let me, I'm trying to put it as kindly as possible, but you did not help yourself with those comments. You're trying to make a joke at the expense of DEI and all of this. You don't know what it is. You don't know, obviously, the history of why it was needed and why it still is, and the detrimental impact that this can have on black people and black students. I want to address a few more of his points before we close out. So in his statement, he, he also said that, let me pull it up. He claims in the video that quote, over 900 studies have shown that DEI programs don't make the workplace better for minorities. In fact, it can actually make things worse because of the backlash effect, end quote. Where are the studies at Charlemagne? You claim to have 900 studies that show that. Where are the receipts? Let's see the receipts. If you're going to make a statement like that, even on a comedy show, have some receipts to back it up. Let's go to an article from the Harvard Business Review entitled, How Investing in DEI Helps Companies Become More Adaptable. In a detailed study of 79 large companies, we found that every 0.1 point improvement in DEI ratings for a company on a five point scale was linked to a corresponding 13% increase in the absolute change power score on average. Our previous research has found change power to be associated with a two time improvement in EBIT margins and 1.5 to three time improvement in revenue growth. And they define change power as a way to, for organizations to measure, quantify, and build their ability to change. We noted that companies with high change power had better financial performance, stronger culture and leadership, and more engaged and inspired employees. So basically, DEI initiatives increased 
company's change power, as they notate it, which then the company had a better financial performance, better culture, better leadership, and more engaged employees, which ultimately benefits who? Black people that work for that company. That's one benefit, according to the study of DEI, okay? I want to go back to the McKinsey publication. They put out a publication called Diversity Wins, How Inclusion Matters. This is from May 2020. In their introduction, they say the business case for inclusion and diversity is stronger than ever. For diverse companies, the likelihood of outperforming industry peers on profitability has increased over time, while the penalties are getting steeper for those lacking diversity. Not anymore in Texas. Um, Progress on representation has been slow, yet a few firms are making real strides. A close look at these diversity winners shows that a systematic business-led approach and bold concerted action on inclusion are needed to make progress. They say that this publication is the third in a McKinsey series investigating the business case for diversity following why diversity matters from 2015 and delivering through diversity in 2018. They say that this report shows not only that the business case remains robust, but also that the relationship between diversity on executive teams and the likelihood of financial outperformance is now stronger than ever. So again, according to these two studies and articles, Charlemagne is wrong. I don't know what 900 studies he is referring to that says that DEI has not been effective. We know that diversity is important and that not only just diversity, but black people having the, these equal access, having this equal access is important as well. So Charlemagne, look, you tried to roast DEI. You, you did not come through with the facts. It was obvious you did not know what DEI was and is and the purpose of it on how it was a part of this long, slow grind of us trying to get the equality Um, that we deserved, especially after the end of the Civil War in the mid-1800s, and then finally in the mid-1900s, getting that landmark legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the executive orders about affirmative action, the DE policies that were put in place, don't nullify the contributions that our ancestors made to fight for our equality. So y'all, that's all that I have for today. I saw that clip. I was like, I got to address Charlemagne. He's, He's always coming out with some ignorant stuff. So I hope that you all learn from this. Tell me what you all thought about his statement and what are your feelings about DEI in general? We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you once again for visiting this video. Please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next one. Peace.